All right, who's ready for the new series? I thought it was better to launch the new series with a video rather than me telling you what it is. Check this out. quick microphone switch before we start. We seem to have a technical issue. Let's mute that one, please, guys. Just bear with me. <laughs> Thank you. You'd think I'd get used to that by now, but... God's guardrails. Now, this is going to be a very, very different type of series. It's going to be very practical, very life application, and the goal of this series is health. Turn to your person next to you and say, health. Who wants to be healthy? Body, mind, and soul. And we're going to be talking about healthy marriages, homes, finances. We're going to be tackling some very difficult topics in society, but I believe will bring health to our lives. And so the, 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 the series is called God's Guardrails. Now, the idea behind a guardrail, as we've just seen in the video, is that if you hit the rail, you will do less damage than if you hit what is on the other side of the rail. I think there was probably a 200 meter fall. Who thinks that driver was, had, had a bit of a, an escape there? And uh, if it wasn't for the guardrail, I'm pretty sure that that would have been a life-changing moment uh, for that driver. And so the guardrail causes a little bit of damage uh, to the car as opposed to a lot of damage if it hadn't been there in the place. And in the video, the car was damaged, but the guardrail stopped what would have been a human tragedy. Now, the definition of a guardrail, I've got two guardrails on the stage. The, the definition is a system designed to keep vehicles or people straying into areas that are either dangerous or off limits. And we're going to look at the scriptures and what God's word says are some of the guardrails for our life. Because God wants you to live with purpose in safety. He does not want to see people falling off the cliff of life. Has anyone ever met someone and you've given them some good advice, you've given them some good guardrails for their life and they do the exact opposite? Obviously no one in this church in other churches and in other... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and as we begin, as we open up this series for the next few weeks, um, we're, we're going to hit some guardrails. We're going to bump into some guardrails. And you know in a car, in the modern car, if you bump into some guardrails or you hit something, warning lights come on. And there are going to be some warning lights that are going to come on in our lives. And a lot of you are going to sit in this series, sit listening to this series and go, oh, I wish my husband was here. Or I wish my wife was here. Or I wish my kids could. But God wants to speak to you. The reason you're here and I'm here is we need to hear it. Okay? So, you know, don't be posting the video saying this is for someone else. This is for you. Okay? This, this series is for me. Turn to the person next to you and say, this series was designed for me. So wives and husbands, I don't want to see any of this nudging going on. All right? I don't want to see any of this tapping of the foot down. I know what you guys are up to. The hardest part of Chantal and I's job 
is not raising finances for the new building. The hardest part of our job is watching people who make decisions which are in contrary to God's word, and you know where that decision is going to end up, and you have to watch. If you've been around for long enough, you'll, you'll know that people... And so what God does is he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put some guardrails in your life because it's far better to hit a guardrail than to fall off the cliff. 1998, I was in a city called Jos in northern Nigeria with Graham Hollinger, who was in the first service. And uh, we were teaching in a boys' secondary school, and I was 17, Graham was 19, and we had a lot of fun. No mischief, just all fun. And um, we, uh, we used to go to Jos, it was about 100 miles drive from where we lived, for a burger on a Saturday, because there was a burger place, one burger place, and we would get in a taxi with 15 other people, three chickens and two goats, and we would share the ride all the way to Jos just to get a burger, just so we could get a taste of something familiar. And I remember one day we got out of the taxi, we were walking down the road in Jos, and suddenly I disappeared. I literally disappeared. I'd fallen into an open sewer, straight down. <laughs> True story. And my little friend, Graham Hollinger, all I looked up and I saw him laughing. <laughs> now, thankfully, it was before the days of social media, before the days of, you know, instant cameras, so there's no record of it, praise God. I won't, I'll spare you the details. All I know is, if there had been a guardrail on the road in Joss, I wouldn't have hurt my ankle and been covered in all sorts of things. I'm still here to tell the, to, to tell the tale. The first thing I want to think about today is this. This is our series phrase, and it's, this is our God book, and this is our guide book. This is our God book, and this is our guide book. And God uses guardrails to establish boundaries in our lives. Now, I want to say this from the start, is God never does anything to punish us he does it because he loves us. So God places guardrails in Scripture, not because he says, you know what I want to do? I want to make your lives as miserable as possible. No, he does it because he loves you so much. He says, I want to protect you from that relationship. I want to protect you from that decision. I want to protect you from that thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place some guardrails to help you so you stray, stay on, on track because I, I know the plans and the purposes I have towards you. But guess what? You've got to play your part. And our series verse comes from Ephesians 5.15. Just before we stand and read it. Ephesians is a letter written by Paul to the church in Ephesus. And it's talking to a group of people who, if you can imagine, were probably even more immoral than society we live in today. Not only was adultery acceptable, it was actually practiced as part of their religion. Can you imagine adultery practiced as part of our religion? We encourage you to do these things. And so Paul is in, is, he's backs against the wall and he decides to write a letter to the church. So we're going to just stand, really it's just one verse, but I want us to stand and read this together out loud. Oh, it's a slow rise this morning, four long days, hey? I know, you've been on the couch, haven't you? Are you ready? Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Father, bless the reading and the application of your word. Amen. You may be seated. I think we could, I think we could safely say that the days we're living in very challenging, if not evil, right now. And Paul is saying here to the church in Ephesus that you've got to drive between the lines. We've got to create some guardrails in our lives to drive between them. And he's trying to keep us from going into areas of danger. Any parent, you know that you lock the gate or you, you lock the door. We, we, we try and put guardrails in our homes to protect our children. We might put the knives away if they're young. We might hide the candy. Why? Because we want to keep our children from danger. And I want to say this from the start. This, this series is not a matter of legalism. It's a matter of love. Okay? I, 
I don't like legalism. I don't like religion. That sounds strange coming from a pastor. I don't like being told what to do, but I do know that God's word gives us guidelines to live our life by. I want to share two stories. One's a modern day story. And then it's, I want to go to a passage of scripture in the Gospels. When Chantal and I were living in Cape Town, South Africa, one afternoon I was minding my own business in my blue Peugeot 307. Driving down the road, there it is. She was a faithful friend. Has anyone had a faithful car? Just, just faithful to the end. Just, just always faithful, just always there, always smiling. That was my friend. She just always looked after me, my Peugeot. And we had her from day one to the final day. She was always there for us. And I was traveling down the road to a, a town called Milnerton. And um, I looked in my rear view mirror and there was a blue light flashing. Who knows, the first thing you do is you look at your speed, don't you? <laughs> and you either go, I'm safe, or I need to apply the brakes. This was an apply the brake moment. But it was too late. And the officer, he, he pulled me over and... Uh, he said two things. He f- said, do, first of all, do you know the speed limit on this road? I said, I think it's 60 mile an hour, officer. He said, do you know how fast you were going? I said, I think I was going 61, officer. He said, you weren't going 61. He said, you were going 68, 69. He says, he says I'm going to let you off this time. <laughs> Don't you love it when they say that? He said, but I want to remind you that these speed limits are for the safety of yourselves and others on the road. He said, don't let me see you doing this again. And trust me, I thanked him profusely and we went our separate ways. Now, I wonder what my reaction would have been in that moment if the officer had pulled me over and said, speeding again, Pastor Norman? I know that Peugeot 307, I know it's got a little bit more in the engine. Why don't you try pushing it a little bit faster? And who knows a police officer is never going to tell you to put your foot down faster. Or I wonder what my reaction would have been if the police officer would have said, step out of the car, put your hands on the bonnet, you're under arrest. Let's just hold that story for one moment. Second story is in the Gospel of John. Jesus, healing a man with a disability. Last week, we read a similar story. It says, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for the Feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One was there, had been an invalid for 38 years. Again, context like last week, if you had a disability which uh, inhibited you from working, you were segregated by society, and you were made to live in communes with other people of similar situation. And all we have here is an invalid, a man with no name, not able to move. We don't know exactly his condition. All we know is he'd been in the same condition for 38 years years, 38 years of dashed hopes, 38 years of trying to his life to change. It says then when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? A very odd question for a man who's been sick for 38 years. That's a different sermon. Verse 7, sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me get into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once, The man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Jesus heals. He commands the sickness to leave the body. And immediately, this invalid man is healed. Two stories. The first story, my story. The second story from the Bible. What the officer and Jesus did were very similar. Firstly, they both extended grace. What is grace? Grace is giving me what I didn't deserve. The officer showed me grace. He said, you were speeding, but this time I'm going to let you off. The the, the invalid man for 38 years, he'd been sick. What was the first thing Jesus said before he forgave his sins? Before he, He said, take up your mat and walk. He healed him. He extended grace. Then... He spoke truth. What was the officer said to me? He said, I don't want to see you doing this again. 
What did Jesus do when he was in the temple? He said to the man, stop sinning or something else worse could happen to you. We don't know why this man was an invalid. Maybe, he was a, uh, maybe he'd been stuck on drugs. Maybe he'd been stuck on alcohol. And his condition, his, his, his choices were causing him uh, his, his physical condition. We don't know what the situation was. All we know is that whatever he was doing was causing his body to react in an adverse way. And so Jesus came along. And the first thing he did is he said, I'm going to heal you. But then he said, I'm not just going to heal you. I'm going to speak truth. And Jesus shows grace, which the invalid man desperately needed, and then Jesus speaks truth. And here we have God's guardrails for our lives. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. Jesus is the only person that we know who bestowed grace on this man. Life had walked all over him. We don't know why he was in that condition. All we know is was his life, he was as good as dead. And we see the character of Jesus. The first thing he does is he extends grace to this man. And the second thing he does is he speaks truth. What can we learn from this? The first takeaway in our guardrail series. This is... This is kind of the premise of where we're going. We all need forgiveness, but we all need instruction. We all need forgiveness, but we all need instruction. God's prescription for a healthy life is grace and truth. I want to talk this morning, or this afternoon, or this morning, we're going to go into the afternoon in just a moment, on unlimited grace and absolute truth. God is the God of unlimited grace. Unlike the traffic officer, whose grace would have worn out the next time we bumped into each other, unlike your parents, unlike your boss at work, unlike anyone else, God's grace is extensive beyond imagine. But he is also the God of absolute truth. At Bible college, I remember lecturers who just shouted and spoke the truth. If we were late, they would point us out in front of the whole class. If we forgot to do our homework, we would get humiliated in front of everyone. And they called themselves the truth guys. Now, here's what happens when you only bring truth into people's lives. And some of you are not going to like this. But if you only speak truth, here's what happens. Rebellion. Rebellion. People rebel when there's only truth. Then there was teachers at Bible school who only showed unlimited grace. So we'd walk in late with a coffee. Oh, so lovely to see you. Take a seat. Catch up in your own time. Forget your homework. Don't worry about it. Catch up next semester. And it was just grace, grace, grace. Then there was Mark Hopkins, the college principal. He had this amazing balance of God's guardrails of grace and truth. Have you ever met anyone, a teacher or someone who tells you off and you feel better? Yeah. <laughs> you ever met anyone who's like, I feel better? Because they have this incredible balance of grace and truth. So I want to share three absolutes of grace and truth real quickly as we kick off this, uh, as, as we kick off this series. Number one is this, grace and truth are one. Grace and truth are one. First, the first part of this verse says, Jesus saw him lying there. For 38 years, everyone else had seen him lying there, but Jesus saw him lying there. This was going to be a different day because Jesus was lying there. John 1.14, look, look what it says. This describes the Father. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten the Father. Ready? Full of So when Jesus looks at this invalid man, it wasn't just Jesus, it was grace and truth. For his whole life, this invalid, maybe all he'd heard was the truth from people. People walk by, you need to get a job. You need to get off drugs. You need to stop drinking. And probably he needed to do all of the above. 
But then Jesus comes along. Or maybe, maybe the grace people came past. Oh, poor you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me get you a sausage roll from Greg's. And it's all grace, 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 grace. But Jesus comes along and he says, he does need a sausage roll from Greg's. And he does need to hear some home truths. He says, let me do it my way. I want to model. I want to show you something. Because I'm not just all truth. And I'm not just all grace. I am grace and truth. And he doesn't just say grace. He says, full of. He's full of grace. You know, some people are sort of half empty on grace. Or running over with truth. Jesus said, no, no, I'm, I'm full of grace and truth. Often our view of our Heavenly Father can be determined by our experience of our earthly father. If your, if your father didn't care much, maybe grace was in abundance. Maybe he just let you do whatever you want. You came home from school, you could eat what you want, play where you want, go where you want. And so it was just, your house was just grace. And it was just, or maybe you grew up in a home where your father, all he did was discipline you. And all it was was just shout at you and tell you what not to do and what you should do. And so you grew up in a very legalistic environment. And so all you understood was the truth. And he used to scream verses like, the truth will set you free. Or maybe you were in the grace home where you just literally had to raise yourself. For all of us, we had our own experience. But the Father is full of grace and truth because they are one. And you know, the reality is, church, we need both guardrails in our lives. Grace and truth. Grace and truth is like the co-pilot saying to the pilot, what wing shall we use today? I mean, who knows that you need both wings to fly the, to fly the aircraft? And Jesus is saying, you can't just have grace without truth, and you can't have truth without grace. You cannot separate grace from truth or truth and grace, because grace and truth are embodied in the person of Jesus. He is grace and truth. In the Old Testament, all we had was the truth. It was called the law. So when Jesus saw the invalid of man, he, said, he says in John 1.17, the law, truth, was given through Moses, the Ten Commandments. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. If you broke the rules in the Old Testament, you would have been punished, even put to death. But thankfully, Jesus came and he fulfilled the law. He completed the work. So now he says, I'm not just going to bring truth to the situation. I'm going to bring grace. But he said, I'm not just going to bring grace. I'm going to bring truth. Because grace and truth are one. So we're going to look at some of these, we are actually going to touch on some of the Ten Commandments in the series, but we're going to look at them through the eyes of the New Testament. Because grace and truth are synonymous. Is anyone thankful for the grace of God? Come on, are you grateful? Come on. Is anyone thankful for God's grace and His mercy in your life? Come on, I'm thankful. The steadfast love of the Lord. Look at this, Lamentations 3.21. He says, but I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. It is new every morning. Great is my faithfulness. Do you know what gives me the greatest hope every day is this, God's grace. What gives me the greatest hope every day? And look, look what the writer of Lamentation says. He says, but I call this to mind and therefore I have hope. I'd never read the scripture before. If you've lost hope, you've lost sight of God's grace. Look at this. I call this to mind. You've got to call it back to mind, God's grace, every single day. That's why the writer said every single morning, remind yourself that God's grace covers you. Past, present, future, finished work. It was completed on Calvary. You are forgiven. And so if you've lost hope, you've probably lost sight of God's grace. Grace and truth are one. Number two, the second, the second absolute here is this. Grace is who we are. Truth is how we live. Grace is who we are. Truth is. Jesus said to him, verse 8, get up, pick up your mat and walk. First thing Jesus did was, 
showed grace, showed who he is. If Christ is truly alive in us, I'll say this carefully, but if Christ is truly alive in us, people should be able to see grace and truth. Now, if I, if I neglect my personal devotion with God, this is just personal to me, but I'm, I'll see whether you can share any similarities with this. If I neglect my personal devotion, my daily devotion, reading my Bible, prayer every day, this is what I found. I don't stop speaking truth, but I do stop showing grace. Because truth, we all know the truth. We all know we shouldn't steal. That's never going to change. But when you get into God's presence, what he does is he tops up your grace. He tops up your grace. So if your fuse is running low with people, the chances are you need to top up your grace. Who has challenging relationships? Five of us. <laughs> All right, we're going to try this again, and this goes for you at home as well. Who has challenging relationships? If you don't, you probably need to get out more. <laughs> Miracle, my daughter who read that beautiful prayer, when she was five years old, we were living in... How old was she? Oh, she was one. She wasn't five. <laughs> Grace. <laughs> and truth. She was one and a bit. <laughs> she was one. And she had a blocked tear duct in her eye. And um, it was just a minor operation, but she had to go over under a local anesthetic. And um, we got to the hospital in Cape Town, and the, the, the doctor said, we only allowed one parent to come in, and um, you choose. So daddy went in, and... Um, she laid on this, and they, they told her it was like Disneyland in there. It wasn't Disneyland. She could realize at one year old, this was not Disney. This was an operating theater, and things were not normal. And so um, as a parent, you're always a little bit nervous. And anyway, they held her down. She was screaming. And this, this amazing doctor placed this little, little injection just on the side of her eye just to, just to numb her up. And, uh, and she fell asleep as well. And then when she was asleep... He got this knife, tiny little knife, and right in the corner of her eye, he made an incision, and he unblocked the tear duct. And as a dad, I watched this take place. I was like, "Wow, this is it!" Like, as much as this is my daughter, these, you know, doctors out there, you guys are amazing. Okay, you are absolutely incredible. Give it up for all of our doctors and surgeons. And as she laid there, I felt God said this to me, many, many years ago. Ten years, nine years ago, he says, you inject grace before you operate with truth. I'll say that again because someone needs to hear this in the challenge in relationships. You have to inject grace before you operate with truth. Can you imagine the carnage in that hospital if they'd have just went straight in with the knife? She would have screened that place down. I mean, you know, you see the war movies when they stick a piece of wood in people's mouths and then they cut her legs off. I mean, that was real. That was real happening. Thankfully, today we have all this, you know, all these modern anesthetics. But grace always opens the door for truth. This man in this story, he needed to hear, stop sinning. He needed to hear some home truths. But Jesus said, I want to just show you in front of all the disciples and the Pharisees and all the people looking, I want to show you a blueprint for how to operate. He said, before you do anything, you inject grace. Because when you inject grace, it opens them up to bring the truth. You see, without grace, we're not actually qualified to speak truth. In scriptures, whenever Jesus or the Father or God is spoken about in grace and truth, grace always precedes truth. He never says full of truth and grace. He always says full of grace and truth. Because grace precedes truth. And when we open the door and show Christ's grace to people in our lives, it opens the door for truth. You know when you pay your bills early, that's grace. But it gives you an opportunity to invite the person to church. 
If you miss a bill and you don't pay people on time, you've got a bad reputation, it's very hard to bring truth. You know, when we turn the other cheek, guess what it does? It gives an opportunity to give you the reason why you turn the other cheek. And grace always opens the door for truth. Grace is often the last thing that you want to do, but the first thing you need to do. Grace. And at Soul Church, truth is what we teach, but grace is who we are. It's not all grace and it's not all truth. Grace and truth are one. You know the big reason people leave church is they only want grace. But if all we do is bring grace, here's what happens. People don't change. If that surgeon had just in, in, injected Miracle's eye without the knife, there is no change in her situation. It might numbed her up, made her feel better, made her feel a little bit more comfortable. And so if I come in here and just tickle your ears every Sunday, but don't bring truth, there can never be change in people's lives. But grace opens the door for truth. And so we owe it to church, we owe it to society, we owe it to act. I think silence on certain subjects and issues is causing more damage to the church right now because we're not speaking about truth. All we're doing is injecting grace. For example, as a church, we're going to teach on what the Bible says on marriage. We believe not in soul church marriage. We believe in biblical marriage. It's between a man and a woman. That's not my idea. That was God's idea. That's not John's idea. We believe in, we believe in sex. God created sex. But sex was created in the boundaries, the guardrails of marriage. The guardrails of marriage. Because anything outside of that can cause harm and emotional and physical pain. And God simply calls it sin. And we've watered the word sin down to poor choices. But sin is not poor choices. Sin is what separates us from God. When it comes to creation, we believe that we were made in the image of God. The very first scripture in the Bible says, for God created the heavens. We didn't come off the back of a big bang. We didn't come out of a chimpanzee. We were created by Almighty God. <laughs> Truth. Why? Now, 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 listen. If you don't believe any of that, here's the thing. You are totally welcome. This is an environment of grace. Grace is who we are. We love you. You come as you are. You, you, it's not my job to change people, but it is my job to point people towards the truth. So this is a church which is full of grace, but teaches the truth. Because all we do is grace, grace, grace. Nothing's going to change your life. But if all we do is truth, 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 it's going to push people away. He is the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Is anyone getting this today? Yeah. This, can be a, this, this can help you. I promise you, this can help you at work. Because some of you, you're just banging truth down people's throats and you're wondering why they don't want any of it. It's because there's no injection of grace. Buy them a coffee first. Take them to Pizza Hut. Show them that you love them and you care for them. And it'll open the door for truth. Why? Because truth does set you free. And we owe people truth. We owe people. We've got to speak truth. I know guy came into my office a while ago and he said, I've, got, you know, I've just got my girlfriend pregnant. I just don't know how it happened. <laughs> I'm thinking you pretty much know how it happened. <laughs> We're a church of grace and truth. You know, the church was founded on grace. It was founded on grace. Peter, what a dropout. I mean, what a mess up. He denied the very existence of Christ. And Jesus says, you're my man. He should have picked John. <laughs> he was the one after John's own heart, God's own heart. John was like, he didn't have many issues. He should have picked John, but you see, Jesus, he couldn't pick whoever else. He needed to pick a trophy of grace. Because Peter, as Nathan Finocchio so cleverly put, 
God chooses weirdos and whack jobs. If you miss Sunday night, you miss Sunday night. That's all I'm saying. But God takes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So God says, you know what I'm going to do? Jesus said, Peter, I'm just going to mess everyone's stereotype up of what should be a leader. I'm going to choose you. But by the way, we're going to have some home truths. And he chooses him. And then you all know the story after, after Jesus rises again. They're going to have, they're going to have some breakfast, some, a fish breakfast on the beach. And Jesus, he, he lets Peter know three times that you know, wise up on some of this stuff, mate. So Jesus isn't just all grace. He is truth. I think, if anything, grace welcomes people, but truth changes people. And I don't think it's enough just to welcome people. I think we're doing you a disservice just to welcome you into Soul Church. I think, actually, it's truth that changes people. I can't just allow the, what the world is doing to my kids the way it's indoctrinating them in some of this stuff. It's messing kids' lives up. We've got to stand for truth. We have to stand for truth. One day we all have to give an account. And one of the things is, did we stand for truth? Did we extend grace and did we show truth? And so this is our time. This is our moment. This is our hour for the church of the living God to stand with grace and truth. Jesus comes and he says, he says, I know I healed you. He says, I don't want to say this, but you need to stop sinning. We don't know what that sin was. We don't know what addiction it was. It could have been, we don't know what it was because Jesus never humiliates people. He never brings out all the details in front of public. He says, I just want you to stop doing whatever you're doing because if you can stop, this won't come back into your life. And then the third absolute here is this, that grace and truth leads to life. It says in verse 9, at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. For the first time in his life that we know of, he walks. So what happens is this. Grace protects us, as we saw in the video, but truth leads us. I'll say that again. Grace is there for your protection, but truth is there for your direction. Grace is there to cover you when you mess up and you fall. And trust me, no one needs God's grace more than Pastor John Norman. You know what? No one needs God's truth more than Pastor John Norman. I need His grace and I need His truth. Jesus said this. He said, I am the way. What's God's way? His way is the grace way. Grace. I am the truth which leads to life. In fact, for all you people who love maths, I've got a little equation to help you. Just need to take away from today. It's coming up right now. Grace. There it is. Grace plus truth equals life. If all we have is grace, we stand still. If all we have is truth, we rebel. But when you mix grace and truth together, you lead to life. How many of you are glad that when it came to you, God started with his grace? Who's glad it didn't start with truth? I've said this before, I'll say it again, I said it in a different series, but they did a survey in the UK 10, 10, 12 years ago, and they did the top two reasons why people don't come to church. And number one reason was this, they'd been. What's the number one reason you don't go back to a restaurant? You've been, you've had bad service, you've had bad food, you've had a bad experience, so you don't go back problem is people have come into church and all they've heard is don't do this don't do that don't say that don't go there and what the truth does is it pushes people away so God said no 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 no. it isn't right to do that it isn't wrong to do it but here, here just just come with me I want to use grace so our doors are open to our city we have people from different faiths who come to this church we have atheists who come to soul church because they just love the environment that's fantastic come as you are 
But my prayer is this, you won't stay as you are. Because my prayer is that you'll hear some truth in God's word and it'll help you move forward. But grace and truth, God always begins with grace. And when I study the life of Jesus, whenever someone made a mistake, Jesus never rubbed it in, he rubbed it out. He had this way of just rubbing out people's mistakes, forgiving them and blessing them and helping them. And this series is not to rub in our mistakes because if it is, we're all in trouble. This series is to help rub some of them out because there are many dangers on the other side of these guardrails. There are some things that you cannot see further down in your life. And God is saying, I'm trying to protect you. I know it feels good in the moment. And I know it seems good. And I know culture is saying, go that way. But God is saying, I need to protect you because you're my child. You're my child and I cannot let you go. So if you can just live within the boundaries, the guardrails of my, my word, I can, I can help you live your life. God's guardrails aren't to stop you enjoying life. They're actually to keep us free. So grace and truth are one. Grace is who we are and truth is what we do. And grace and truth lead to life. I'm going to pray in just a moment because I want to pray for two groups of people. The first is you're struggling with the guardrail of grace. You struggle to extend grace to others. Maybe for others it's the guardrail of truth. Like you just, some of you thought, oh, I'm going to skip this series. This one's not for me. I, it's too close to the bone. You know, we're going to deal with some issues in this series and some of it's going to be a bit uncomfortable. I'm 44 soon. Like if I don't start speaking truth soon, <laughs> what do we got to lose? I tell you what we got to lose. People go over the other side of the guardrail. So the guardrail of grace, I like to call this the blueprint of grace in Matthew 22. He was challenged saying, what's, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus comes back. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. He said the second part commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. You know, to, I think we all need to extend more grace to each other, but to start extending grace towards each other, the first thing you have to do is receive grace yourself. Receive, understand how much you're loved. It's easy to love someone else if you understand that you're loved already. It's far easier to love Chantel when I know that she loves me. It's far easier for her to love me when I've told her that I love her. And I want to remind you again today that you are loved. I want to remind you again today that you are forgiven. God's grace was not a once-off gift. God's grace is new for you every single day. And maybe you grew up in a legalistic church environment. I want to tell you again, you are unconditionally loved by God. You're loved. Grace from God. And when we, when we find grace from God, this is what happens next. We find grace for ourselves. Because Jesus says something really interesting. He says, hey, I want you to love your neighbor, love the person at work as yourself. The reason we struggle to love other people is we don't love ourselves. We've got to receive the love from God and then we've got to be kind to ourselves. You know, I'm really hard on myself. Is anyone else hard on yourself? Come on, just show your hand. None of this little golf hand. Come on, who's hard on yourself? I get hard on myself. Now here's... The good thing about being hard on yourself is you can get a lot done. You can push yourself to the limit. The back side, the bad side of this, if you're hard on yourself, you'll probably be hard on others. God just wants us to say today, just be kind to you. Before you can try and be kind to anyone else, just be kind, just, just let, give yourself some slack. If you're struggling with others, start with you. You didn't go to the gym this week. It's all right. 
go next week. You didn't eat well this week. You had too many barbecues like I did. It's okay. Don't be too hard on yourself. Sometimes we get so hard on ourselves and in being hard on ourselves, we get hard on others. Jesus is saying, first of all, receive my grace and then show grace to yourself and then we get to extend grace to others. He says, love your neighbor, your work colleague, your parents, the person you disagree with politically. And the world is... The world is on the defense right now and there's nothing that will disarm people more than extending God's grace. God's given us great grace. So let's extend that great grace to others. I want us to stand. I want us to receive God's grace afresh in our lives. Does anyone need to receive His grace today? Come on, just receive His grace. Just lift up your hands, just like a little cup and receive His grace. I feel like there's some people here today and you've lost sight of God's grace. Maybe you've been caught up in all sorts and God just wants you to remind you today He loves you. Receive His grace. Receive the steadfast love of the Lord. Receive His grace, His mercy. It is new every morning. It is faithful towards you. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, God. Hallelujah. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. in your mistakes he wants to rub them out he's removed them from the far as the east side is from the west side let's sing that one more time let's sing that together I know it's an old hymn but I just wanted to remind you today about his steadfast love towards you thank you Jesus the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O oh Lord. Great is your faithfulness. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercy forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, we can't extend grace to others until we realize we've been forgiven. We 
praise you, God. We worship you, Lord. show ourselves grace and then we extend grace to others and this is the bit where more often than not we can get it wrong so Father right now I want want us just to have an honest moment where you go there's a relationship friendship maybe or something that's happened somewhere you need need God's grace towards that person, it could be a son, a daughter parent maybe you've been operating with truth without grace but you're saying today, I understand that I need to start injecting some grace before I pray with truth. So God, help me. Help me extend grace. That could be a little gift in the post. It could be, could be a message. It could be a phone call. It could be, but God, give me the grace. Who, who needs God's grace in a relationship? Just slip up your hand. Father, right now, I pray for every relationship that's broken down, fragmented. Every relationship, Father, that's need your grace I pray that we would be light bearers we would come in and inject grace a smile a phone call a hug father we would see relationships built up and walls broken down through this series give us strength father to do the right thing in Jesus name more time let's sing that the steadfast love the steadfast love of the lord never ceases god mercies never come to an end they are new every morning new every morning great is your faithfulness oh lord great is your faithfulness wants to extend some grace to to you right now and I don't know your story I don't know your journey but God does and he loves you whether you're watching online in your living room at your workplace you're listening by podcast you're sitting here standing here in the room God's grace is towards you and today we're not here to talk about your past like the invalid man not here to talk about the last 38 years of your life we're here to talk about the next 38 years of what it can look like with God. Today, God wants to firstly, He just wants to show you His grace. And He wants to remind you and tell you, maybe for the first time, that you're loved. And you can receive His grace. And you can receive forgiveness for your past. And you can receive hope for tomorrow. But it begins by saying, today I need Jesus. I need grace. And I need truth in my life. You need those guardrails to help your life move forward. Maybe your life, you keep falling off the cliff. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's something that's happening in a relationship and you keep making the same mistake and falling over the edge and God's saying, hey, I want to help you. I want to help you get back up. I want to help you on the right path, on the right track. But it begins by opening up your heart to Jesus. It's not by another one night. It's not by another uh, beer can. It's not by another injection. It's not by any of those things. They only bring happiness for a moment. What brings eternal happiness is a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus, to receive His grace. Maybe you're standing there saying, I'm just not good enough. Hey, none of us are good enough. That's why Jesus came down and He met us exactly where we're at. So I'm I'm praying for you right now. Every Christian in this room, I want you to begin to pray because I'm going to throw out a lifeline. I'm just saying today, I want to receive Jesus. From the front to the back, left to the right, 
All I want you to do is just slip up your hand and say, John, include me in that prayer. Are you ready? One, two, three. Just slip up nice and high. I want to receive the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus. Come on, a lot, many, many hands going up this morning. I want to receive the grace of Jesus. Amazing. Here's what I want to do. I want to, I don't want to embarrass you, but I would love to shake your hand and pray with you a really special prayer. And so I want, you can bring someone with you. I just want you to step out of your seat and come and join me down the front, okay? So don't even think about it. We're going to, I'm going to come, that's it, keep coming. I'm going to come and join you as well. If you lifted up your hand, just, just step out of your seat, sir. That's it, come on. Come on, all of you. If you made that decision, even if you didn't make that decision, come, you come, come to Jesus, come on. Well done, it takes a lot of courage, but we want to say this publicly. Come on, keep singing. We're going to keep bringing it. The steadfast love. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercy is never Come on, if you want to come, you come. See, this is what happens when you inject grace first. People are still coming. Come on, keep cheering. They are new every morning. God's grace. See, it's grace that leads people to the truth. We're going to say this prayer right now. I'm tearing up because I love it. Because my wife and I, this is why we do what we do. It's not just to bring great coffee, even though the coffee's good. We don't just run a supermarket just to feed people. We want to see people's lives changed. So we get really excited in this moment and emotional because this is what, this is what changes. The people are still coming. That's it, buddy. You can still come. We're going to say a prayer and it's going to come up on the screen. And I want you to say this prayer from your heart. This isn't just a ritual. This is a prayer that moves you from an old life to a new life, from darkness to light. So can we say, in fact, we're all going to say it together because we're like one big family in here. Can we do that? Yeah. Dear, Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for dying for me. To forgive all my sin, to forgive all my sin and my failures. And my so that I can have a brand new start. So that I can have a brand new start. Please come into my life. Please come into my life. And help me by the power of your Holy Spirit. And help me by the power of your Holy Spirit. To trust and live for you. To trust and live for you. Amen. 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 Come on, let's give these guys a hand.